I wanted to start if I could get your uh, your reaction or your thoughts on, on being named uh, the American Conference Coach of the Year this morning. Yeah, I, I literally just found that out um, 60 seconds ago. You know, uh, team success. You know, when you have a when you have a good team and you accomplished uh, what these kids have accomplished. Uh, our, our staff was uh, our staff is outstanding every year. But uh, you know, we we depend so much on our kids getting better once they get here. You know, um, you know, we don't spend a lot of time worrying about uh, stars and. The BS like that. We say, okay, we like a kid. Let's develop him. Uh, we think he fits culture-wise, things that we value, uh, core values of our program, and get him better. And that's a um, that's a shared that's a shared responsibility. And then um, once we hit October, November, uh, just keep working with the team on things we value, how we want to play, how we want to win games. But this is. Uh, um, I have no idea how many of these things I've won, but uh, this is a this was a really good team. You know, um, you want your team to hit their ceiling, um, just be as good as they can be. You know, now our ceiling is not Gonzaga's ceiling. Our ceiling is not. Oh, I've seen those teams. We don't have those teams' ceilings. We have our ceiling. That's why I don't worry about other teams. I have zero, I have zero interest. I just, I just have interest in our team. I want our team to be the best it can be. How do we make our team, uh, max out with, with our team, um, whatever, whatever our potential is as a team? Uh, and I think that's what we did this year. Just about every night, uh, some nights were better than others. Um, but I was really proud of this team this year. This team's had a really, really good year. Hey, Joseph, we'll go to Mark Berman with Fox 26. Mark, please go ahead. Hey, Kelvin, what are your thoughts about uh, four of your players, Fabian and Josh, first team, Kyle and second team, Jamal, third team, being honored by the AAC? Uh, very deserving. Um, you know, I think that speaks to um, – Right back to development. You know, this time last year, Josh was, uh, had a UConn jersey on. This time last year, Kyler had a Texas Tech jersey on. Neither one of those guys were thinking about Houston. Uh, Jamal was, uh, just a practice guy. He just helped us in practice every day. Uh, Fabian had an ACL tear. So the, none of those guys, uh, this time last year was, was, uh, burgeoning all conference guys. They, they all had a, they all had a personal, uh, hurdles that they had to get over. But, uh, once we got them here and got them ingrained in our culture and how we do things, um, you know, and obviously it goes back to recruiting. You know, I, you know, I think it's a reflection of the way we recruit, the way we evaluate, then the way we uh, develop. Um, all four of those kids are talented kids uh, that bought in to um, uh, helping this team be the best it can be. Thank you, Mark. We'll go to Greg Bailey, KTRK. Greg, go ahead, please, sir. Good morning, Kelvin. Um, j just given the demands of your late season schedule and, and what you've got ahead, um, how do you kind of manage minutes if you plan on doing that at all in the conference tournament? How do you approach that? Well, I don't really have a plan for that, uh, Greg, um, cause we don't have any alternatives, you know, uh, I know our, our kids, you know, anybody in our situation, you know, there's a difference in playing two games a week versus three games a week. You know, nobody plays four games a week, uh, except the NBA. Uh, I remember doing that, uh, when I was in the NBA, I think it was 2011 with the lockout. Everybody came back around December 10th. We went over to San Antonio, played a preseason game. San Antonio came to the Toyota Center, played a preseason game. And I think in the month of January, we played 18 times. And we did not play January 1st. So from the 2nd to the 31st, we had 18 games. I remember how that team was. That was some bad basketball. 
<laughs> Not because of talent. It's because those guys had they they had nothing. They just played too many games. You know, a couple of those games you will play good in, but um, the uh, uh, being able to get some rest this week was important for a lot of reasons. You know, we, once we got back uh, Sunday, I didn't say a lot to the team. Uh, nothing you say, your timing, your delivery, and timing has a lot to do with. Uh, uh, listening. You know, I don't like talking to guys that hear me. I like talking to guys that listen. And if you want them to listen, you better put them in the right situation where um, they're not thinking of a bunch of stuff and not going to remember what you say. So I didn't really say anything to them after the game. Um, um, other than uh, let's get out of here. <laughs> then um, didn't do much, nothing Sunday. We didn't practice on Monday. Uh, I didn't see any of them on Monday. Um, Tuesday, uh, we got organized, uh, watched film, got rid of all that stuff. And we, and, um, you know, we'll practice today, leave tomorrow, uh, play Friday at noon. And if we win, we'll play Saturday. If we lose, we'll come home. I don't, I don't know how to evaluate any more than that. We'll go to back to Joseph Duarte, please. Joseph, go ahead with another question. Kelvin, so, I, I was going to ask you sort of about the, what y'all have done the last few days, but since you answered that, let me pivot and, um, the, uh, the value of, of getting some, even a, a day or two rest, uh, could you, could you sort of sense Maybe that, that, you know, a big relief for the guys, you know, just to get off their feet, you know, just be able to take a step back and, you know, kind of, did you see what you wanted to see and, and, and how they were feeling and how they responded after that, that tough stretch? Yeah. You know, well, um, you know, we keep talking about their legs and indoors. I, I, I think the mental, um, having to, have, you know, we spent a lot of time in scout reports and going over this and going over that. Um, you know, had, I think had we played Cincinnati the fourth game or SMU the fourth game, uh, wouldn't have mattered. You know, uh, that's a lot on their plates. Um, you know, we just happened to play a, a team that was, uh, red hot. I think they've won nine out of 10 or 10 out of 11. I can't remember. Um, uh, I can't say enough. You know, everybody talks about Everybody that's got great home court advantages, they're all great. Um, I, I can't tell you how impressed I was with Memphis's fans. And they're all in. That they, they've got a good thing going there. Um, that fan base is, that, that place was lit. And the level of Memphis's play just raised even higher. When you, when, you know, one team started playing downhill, um, playing downhill with a little Crisco on your wheels, you know, you're pretty fast. And all of a sudden you start playing uphill with, um, um, you know, cement in your shoes. You're pretty slow. Uh, that, that game kind of looked like that in the first half. Um, but you know, we just started out and out and move on. You know, we, we got beat by a better team. That, and that happens sometimes, you know. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that, uh, there's three teams that clinched their conference championship and then lost the next game. Wisconsin, uh, clinched their conference championship, lost at home to Nebraska. Duke clinched their conference championship, lost at home to, uh, North Carolina. You know, uh, you're never, you're never alone in misery. You can always grab somebody and put them in the box with you. <laughs> we'll go back to Chris Gardner. Go ahead, Chris. Coach, how much time will the staff spend on, I guess, scouting the uh, first round matchup, your opponent yeah, in that no, game? It's just you know, this is this is probably my 175th conference tournament. Nothing changes. You know, guys, I uh, have uh, uh, whoever scouted at East Carolina during the year uh, will have East Carolina. Uh, and during that game, whoever got in Cincinnati will have Cincinnati. They'll go up on uh, Wednesday night, uh, drive up on Wednesday night so they can 
you get up there and get to the gym early, sit courtside and scout the game. It's what we always do. Everybody does that. There's no, there's no uh, trickiness to this stuff. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let's see here. We'll go back to Joseph Duarte with another question. Joseph, go ahead, please, sir. Kelvin, this is a little bit off topic, but I was wondering, uh, at, during the weekend, you, you know, I don't know what your relationship is with Coach K at Duke. If, if, if you, you know, were able to reach out to him or if you talked to him this year about his final year of, of playing ball and, and sort of the, the send off that he got this weekend. I think you guys have played twice head to head in your career. Yeah. One of them was at Cameron and the other one was at Madison Square Garden. Um, I remember the one at Madison Square Garden vividly. I think we had about a seven point lead with about seven minutes to go. One of our kids missed a dunk. He had a wide open dunk and he threw it down so hard he hit the back of the rim and uh, bounced to the half court. I turned around sitting right there at the bench, um, and, uh, kicked the, uh, kicked the, um, the uh, scores table to my right. And um uh Ted Valentine was running down the other sideline. He saw me turn around and give me a technical for that. So that then JJ Reddick uh started running due north, hundred miles an hour, turned around and shot south uh, a couple of times and that was a tough game. I mean two good teams. We were really good and Duke was really good. Either team could have won that game. So but no, I, I haven't uh talked to Mike. Um, um, I felt bad for his team though. Um, the team was almost an afterthought in that, uh, that game. You know, it was a tough game as a player. I felt for the players. I watched the game from my hotel room. Um, but you know what, Mike Smith to the game, um, all the praise and all the accolades, all the, all the respect, um, uh, adoration, honors, celebration, everything that he's received, uh, he's earned. I just done it for 42 years, man. You know, guys like that, guys like that, uh, there's certain, there's certain things that probably will never be broken. You say, well, all rules, I mean, records will be broken. I find it hard to believe that somebody's going to break Cal Ripken's record. But that, that one seems to me, Especially in this day and age of, uh, load management and professional sports. Um, I don't know. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to, to, to play. How many years is that? 162 games plus the playoffs if you make the playoffs. But, you know, I'm not a math guy. How I many, what was it? 3,000 something games in a row? Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, how many guys play 162? Exactly what the number is. How many guys play 162 games? Forget 3,000. How many guys play 162? Yeah, 16 uh, years and uh, 26, 32 games. 16 years without missing a game? Yes. No, that, that uh, you should never say never, right? But you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and live on the edge and say that was never going to get broken. <laughs> uh, the other one is K's win total. Um, Mike's win total. You'd have to average 30 wins a year for how many years to win a thousand games? I mean, what is that? It's over. That's over 30, 33, 34 years. Yeah. That, that one's, that was out there. But you know what? Look at the two guys we just talked about. Cal Ripken Jr. and, uh, Mike Krzyzewski. Greatness. You know, guys in this era have a huge advantage for numbers of wins you get because when John Wooden played, when John Wooden coached, they only played 25, 26 games a year. You know, today you play 40. You know, back then, if you won two games, you're in the final four. Now you've got to win four and then win two more. So you can win. There was no conference tournaments back then. That's another three wins. Uh, there was only, 24, 36, 48 as they went along. So a thousand wins, um, is, is, uh, I don't know how many he has. I don't know. What is it? A thousand something, 1100, 1200. 
that's that's uh, that's that's a hard, large benchmark. But I think the greatest uh, com- the the greatest um, respect honor that he's had so far that I've seen from afar that I really respect was how many former players he had to form that tunnel that he walked through. That's what coaches care about. You know, we live in a you know we live in a world of um, you know constant uh, cynicism and constant criticism and constant here's what you did wrong, here's why you're bad, all that stuff. Uh, when he walked out there, and um, I don't know how many players it was, it looked like it was about um, 80 to 100. When he walked through that tunnel, he doesn't need he doesn't need anybody else to say anything good or bad. He doesn't care. And that's the great thing about being older. You don't really care what people think or say. And I'm sure Mike's been there a long time. But you think about uh, um, if he would have gotten hired at Duke this year, he probably wouldn't be co- coaching at Duke anymore. Because he had three years. I think he lost for three years before he won. Um, I know I wouldn't be coaching. I would have gotten fired at Washington State. We went seven and twenty-two my third year. You know, with uh, in today's age, with uh, all the forums and platforms to criticize and um, call out your weaknesses, and people tell you how bad you are, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't make it today, just because of the environment that's created with the negativity. But uh, Mike did, Dean Smith did, you know, and those guys have become. Um, Mount Rushmore. You know, when I think of the Mount Rushmore of college coaching, I start with John Wooden, Mike Krzyzewski, Dean Smith, and Bob Knight. Uh, after that, you can have all the arguments you want. Uh, there's a lot of guys is, that can go up there after those four. But those, those four, to me, um, um, I, I don't go back to Claire B and Adolph Rupp. Um, um, Luke Karnasaka, you know, guys like that. But we have some guys coming up that might can get up there. You know, Mark Few, uh, Scott Drew, Jay Wright. Um, we've got a lot of great young coaches in our game that's, that's coming along. But those, those, those four changed, uh, were generational coaches at a time when, when young coaches were learning how to coach. Uh, Dean Smith really influenced me. Um, because I grew up in that state when he was in his heyday. And I know the influence Coach Knight had on so many uh, coaches. Um, and and, uh, and then uh, Mike, uh, the same way. You know, we've been blessed to have great men and great coaches influence our game. Go back to Chris Gardner, please. Chris, go ahead. Coach, in your opinion, what makes college conference tournaments special? Um, I think the fans, it, it, it all comes back to the fans. You know, they, they get to put on their school colors, um, drive, drive up to the arena, pull up their pom poms, get in there and, and, and pull like hell for their team to win the day so we can see them tomorrow. You know, uh, I remember sitting in Kemper Arena and eight, Play in Missouri in front of 18,000 Missouri fans. Well, that's not fair. For 17,500, there was 500 out Oklahoma fans. Um, uh, sitting in Kemper Arena, uh, coaching there, uh, same thing with 17,500, uh, uh, Kansas fans. You know, now when Oklahoma played Texas or Oklahoma played Texas Tech, mm, not quite 17,500 for us. <laughs> But, um, but that, that, you know, when I think of league tournaments, the, the, um, Pac-10 was just starting them. My first year, I think my first year at Washington State, we beat UCLA and the head coach was Walt Hazard. And after that, I think they fired Walt after that and hired Jim Herrick, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, is that right? I think Jim followed Walt, um, but I, I remember that the game was in Tucson and University of Arizona hosted it. Um, but the team that won the league that year was Oregon State with Gary Payton. 
But the Converse tournament that really opened my eyes to to uh, the fandom, how important it was to the fans, the pride they took was the was um, having that on neutral court, which we're all all you can tell how good your conference is based on where your tournament is. You know, if you're if the you know there was an unfortunate situation last night where fans got in a fight. That's what happens when you that you're inviting that when you're hosting it. Um, doesn't always happen, but there's always that possibility. But this the Big Twelve was in the Big Twelve is in Kemper. Uh, I think the last couple years they went back and forth between Kemper and American Airline Arena in Dallas. I think we, we um, I think we had a stretch where we won three straight. We won two in Kemper, then we won one um, um, in Dallas. But um, you know, Texas is um, is such an underrated basketball state. You know, some some of these guys, it's the uh, the old money schools that's been around for ever with with basketball that really didn't have football. But I think what we've proven in our state is that you can be great in both. You can be great in both. You know, um, um, and and that we're all right there on the verge. You know, look at look at the University of Houston this year. You know, top twenty five in football, top twenty five in uh, basketball. Uh, University of Texas is right there. They can certainly easily be top 25 in both and probably will be here pretty soon. Uh, um, Texas Tech, Baylor, TCU, uh, who am I leaving now? Texas A&M, uh, every, every one of the, the big, the, every one of the schools in Texas, SMU, I would put them in there too. We, we all have a chance to play at a high level, uh, sports. And I think um, uh, the fans are the reason why. You know, our our fans were unbelievable this year. I like, and our team and our team needed it because of our circumstances. We couldn't win it. Those fans, those fans Sunday made a huge difference for both teams. Um, um, so I've I've, I've seen I've seen um, great games in tournament play. And once you get in there and there's a lot of excitement because you know if you lose you go home. You know, we're gonna get in the bus tomorrow morning and drive to uh, Fort Worth. Um, uh, two years ago we got in the bus and got to right right past Corsicana, or right before Corsicana, and pulled off on an exit and turned around and headed to uh, Bucky's and found out that our season was over. So. I'm sure we'll jump into that bus tomorrow. We'll bring back some um, some of those memories. Last, last year was kind of a weird year um, because it was the year after uh, COVID, and but still not many fans at the game. So I'm look, I'm looking forward to it being as close to normal as possible because we got some great fan bases in this league, and I hope they all show up. We'll make the environment special. Uh, time for a couple more questions. Mark Urban, we'll go back to you for one. Go ahead, please. Hillman, how's your overall health, especially Reggie Cheney? How's he doing? Uh, nothing has changed. You know, um, I think there will be a decision made on him. You know, he may have to have surgery. Uh, so his, his, nothing's changed. He's, he's played, he's been a one arm bandit all year. But everybody else is just recovery. You know, um, Emotional, mental. Think about senior night. Think about the mountain those guys climbed that night. The way we won the game. What happened after the game? Um, cutting nets down. That's 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 an emotional, mental uh, investment. Um, but um, for us, it came at the right time. We, we needed to. Normally, you give them a day off, come back, and start doing individual work or position work uh, when you have a long week. But our kids needed two days off. So we we and they were and they were all trying to know our 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 men our short men are the nomad guys we brought them in yesterday and played three on three. Uh Emmanuel Emmanuel Sharp, um, Ramon Walker, Robbie Armbrester, Kieran Powell, um uh JBR, and Ryan Elvin. Those guys played three on three. It's awesome watching them. They, I mean, they were really getting after it yesterday, and they were excited to play. 
just about every everybody else in the team was in there watching him, cheering him on, refereeing, hooting and hollering, talking smack. They're all doing that. So, so, um, but I, I, I didn't want him to shoot. I didn't even want him to shoot free throws. Uh, we just took two days off to rest head to toe. The time for my last question here. We'll go back to Joseph with the Chronicle. Joseph, go ahead, sir. Kelvin, if I could double check on on Reggie, he can still play through the rest of this season. But I mean, that the surgery part, of the decision is after the season. Correct. No, he, he's he's still playing on him. Playing. And like and like um um. His, his, his hand gets, it's like, it's, it's a lot like Tremont's shoulder. Remember before we shut him down, he would play two or three games, get it banged, and then he'd have to sit out, uh, two games or sit out seven or eight days. And then he'd get better, then he'd go in and get hit again. Uh, Reggie's is the same way. I, I'm sure his hands will feel a lot better today because he's, you know, he goes in and gets treatment with John every day. But you know, you, you, you can't treat something. Um, if you look at your middle finger knuckle, the knuckle on your middle finger, that whole area is just constantly swole. It's twice as big as it should be and it's not going to go away. And we just have to see whether just rest will heal it or does he need to go and, and correct it. So I'm sure, I'm sure he's going to get it. If there's no sense to getting an MRI now, what are you going to do? He's, it's not going to get any worse. So they they cleared him to play, and as long as he's cleared to play, Reggie's such a tough kid. You know, um, not ha- not having him, uh, you know, has been a factor. I mean, but that's this year. You know, every coach goes through years where you have injury problems, so that's why you don't make excuses. You just suck it up and move on down the road, man.